kick into it and so we've, we can uh, get a recording up for those who haven't turned up. Um, yeah, welcome all. We know most of you, I don't know you, Anna, but welcome along. Um, yeah, so I don't know, a bit of background, I suppose, in terms of where we're at with the hub. So this is, it's been a long gestation for the hub, but uh, we are still keen to for this sort of to be a, a place where the sheep industry meets a bit or the livestock industry meets a bit and yeah and try and do some of these live events in here to encourage uh, I guess people across our network to communicate with each other as much as anything we'll provide some something to talk about but hopefully it's it's more about people learning from each other is is the strength obviously we're recording this so some of you'll be watching the recording who couldn't make tonight there'll be a few still people out there weaning lambs and doing things um, but yeah, I guess that's the background in the hub. We've sort of, uh, in terms of bringing the podcast and the hub closer together. So we're quite keen to do some of these live events with podcast guests so people can sort of join in and, and be part of that conversation and ask those people the questions that they'd like to ask that I have gotten to ask or didn't ask. Or uh, So yeah, so we're trying to trying to grow this uh, over, over the time and it was, all locked away behind a paywall for a while and and so for, for members and we're sort of now balancing that to have some stuff out here in the in the world and other stuff for, for members only so that's that'll be a balance that you'll see us uh work through and and we're always open to to feedback to ideas and um and mostly to participation and, and involvement the i guess yeah tonight's about the round buying guide so we've uh back uh, a long time ago, uh, 12 or 13 years ago, I developed a round buying guide on behalf of the Sheep CRC. And so that was a sheep cooperative research center in Australia, uh, wrote it. And so it existed for a, for a while. That's now out of sort of print and sort of outdated anyway. Uh, but it's all, you know, all the hard copies have sort of been dealt out. So I don't know, some stage in the last, well, for a while I've been sort of, um, developing it and then last year decided to do it properly and with Sophie's help we pulled it all back together updated it uh, and and then went out to all our members and associated companies to ask for sponsorship to print it and so we were fortunate to uh, so we offered up packages that's why you'll see branding throughout it or ads throughout it and branding on the front of it and stuff is to because those people are, are the ones that paid for the, the printed version and we really do appreciate that that sponsorship which has allowed us to get it out there for free so if you find us anywhere on the road one of our team will have some of these in the boot of their car hopefully so you're welcome to ask them to grab a copy or 10 copies for your production group or whatever you want we're, we're happy to get as many out there or let us know and we'll send them out um you can order them on on our website and get the hard copy and that's just that'll cost you the cost of postage to get it out to you uh and yeah so we're more than happy to get them out there. So it's really uh, try to pull all the bits and pieces, some of the questions we get asked uh, when we're out and about into one booklet. So uh, it, um, I'll bring up the RAM buying guide. Uh, this worked before, hopefully it will again. Um, yeah, so some of you will have downloaded the PDF and had a look or some of you might have a hard copy, but um, yeah, but essentially I'll just go through the sort of intro, then we'll get into the traits that we promised we'd talk about tonight. But essentially we go through uh, a bit of background. Um, you'll see a bit of advertising, but kind of what's a breeding, what is a breeding value, what goes into them, uh, I guess the various age classes. So it's all based on the Australian system, sheep genetics, uh, which is the, the system that we use within the farmable industry of, of New Zealand uh and obviously we've got seal operates in the in the terminals and maternals strong wool industry and and so we're we have plans to develop a book for that but we don't have that done yet so we'll, we're talking about formal today and that's sort of relevant because at the moment we've got people buying formal rams and when we're talking formal we're talking anything sort of half bred and finer for for the kiwis or for in Australia, it's sort of anything that's remotely merino, I suppose, or merino, merino-ish. Um, anything that's sort of more than half merino is sort of what we're talking about. And the 
they're the kind of sheep that what well, in New Zealand that we would run through sheep genetics, whereas obviously all sheep in Australia are run through sheep genetics. So a lot of it's relevant to to any sheep in in Australia, but only to the farm industry in in New Zealand. We've developed there's one of these for each Australia in New Zealand. Um, uh, yeah, not uh, not a, a lot of change between the two. Slightly different change in advertisers and or sponsors and a few word changes to make it to translate um, who who first invented the pavlova and that sort of stuff gets changed a bit but um but mostly it's the same book just just slightly different and a slightly different accent and eskies versus chili bins and all that sort of caper um so yeah we go through breeding bays uh i guess what breeding bays the importance of breeding bays and what what they take out of the equation and so breeding bays are more about the noise that they remove rather than sort of the noise that they add um a little bit around accuracy which gets a bit confusing in the industry a bit about indexes but not we don't go into any specific ones uh helping people understand or helping describe what a percentile band table is because they're relevant um to understand where that when you're looking at a breeding value what does that actually mean within the population uh we talk a bit about correlations because people love to talk about correlations and i've sort of been guilty of that over the years as well uh sort of and there's some classic ones out there, I guess, um, I don't know, in the final game, it's fleece weight and fibre diameter. Generally, if you increase fleece weight, you increase fibre diameter. But the important thing is, I guess, that we keep talking about and harping on about is is that uh, you're not limited by correlations. They they are um, they're the biology that we're working with, but there's always exceptions to the rule. And that's the beauty of breeding rays, really, is that you can find those sheep that don't follow the rules and, and select from them. Uh, we cover a bit about heritability um, and then then we sort of go trait by trait, which is the real strength of, uh, I should just mention the, so yeah, sponsors page that all the people that have, have paid for this to be in a in a written or in a printed form, sorry. So the real value of this booklet is, is this trait by trait uh, descriptions because there's often only five or six traits that you might be interested in and they, and they tend to be uh, different for each individual. Um, and so it sort of goes through about how is it measured, what does it mean? Uh, we do mention the correlations down in this area. So the good are the or the favorable correlations and the not so good are the, are the negative correlations or the undesirable correlations. And they're just things that it's important to know that don't, again, they don't limit you, but, but they, um, they, they are good to know because if you're not, if you're measure, if you're selecting for something and it's correlated with something else and you're not measuring both those things, then the one that you're not measuring will, shift in the direction that the correlation tells it to shift we've tried to within and this will date obviously because the percentile bands change all the time but we did we thought it was useful to put in the sort of units that you you should be looking at or used to looking at in or likely to be looking at uh in in for each trait so this is fleece weight so at the time may 2023 uh this was the so this is the australian version we're going we updated these a bit for the new zealand New Zealand version, which was printed more recently, but the Australian version we're working through today. So the average percentile or the average of the of the drop, and then the top one percent, the top five percent, the top ten percent, and down and so forth. So that if you're new to breeding values, you can have a quick look and say, well, well, back then it was like these are the sort of scale that we should be you're likely to be looking at. We've also put the heritability of each trait uh, up in the, in the corner of each trait because, and I use that a fair bit now i've got a booklet that looks a bit tatty in my car but when people ask me a question i don't have to remember as many heritabilities i can just look at the book but um anyway so that's that's the aim of the book and then if we get down to and so we go through all the a range of traits wool and and reproduction um and we'll get to down to the health trait somewhere um There we go. Sorry. Um, I'll come back to, to those, but at the end of the book, we just go through sort of setting a breeding objective. Um, uh, we will get there eventually. Yeah. So at the end, we sort of go, I guess, back into a summary mode and what a breeding plan looked like. Invite you to download the genetic plan little booklet. Um, 
and sort of the the mantra that we normally talk about the traits that make your money save your time uh save your money and delight the customer and sort of talk about how that those important things uh and sort of the the process you might go through to build that genetic plan uh and then and then sort of finalizing that plan uh talk about how to work out where you're at now genetically where you, and how you might choose to where to buy rams um and yeah structure all those all those sort of things uh, and yeah i guess a little bit how you might want to run a project test on farms so it's a sort of general pretty broad um covering book and then what we'll talk about at the end is is structure so we yeah we've aimed to kind of cover the whole process if if uh if you're well, either new or old, to, it's a it's a good summary, particularly because people are out once a year you're buying rams, and then you're off being a plumber and a nutritionist and a an agronomist and all the other things that farmers have to do, and then when you get back to thinking about um, buying rams that following year, then uh, then it's a good ready reckoner to go back and just check on on those traits, what it means, which what are the abbreviations, because some catalogs will just have the abbreviations, and you sort of need to know roughly what that that means so if we get into the traits we promised to talk about tonight is there any questions any comments any thoughts so far you'll be all muted probably so if you want to unmute that's good silence is something i'm not used to at the moment at school holidays which is quite noisy around here so have you got anything in there that actually help uh, put economic values on the traits to it so that uh, as you're planning your um, selections, you can actually um, put it in economic terms? Yeah, that's a good question. And no, we haven't. Um, yeah, something that we get asked a bit and it's, I guess, the reason we shy away from it a bit is because every production system has a different value for a trait, and so um, yeah, so we've left it in, left it in the helping navigate the technology, but not necessarily whether it's going to make your your money or not. Um, the original book that we did have a few sort of examples of the sort of difference you could expect, but um, yeah, there, and there isn't really. A good tool to to do that because of the complexities on what i mean the tools that we use or that cheap genetics would use are quite complex to work out the value of those those traits and um and so to make it into um something easy is is a bit of a battle but it's something that we we certainly should consider and uh, we've done the i don't know you you will send the ulam decision support tool which was some very complex economic modeling that we ended up running in through machine learning and developing a very easy model so something like that would lend itself to to valuing traits as well so that's something that but that was a sort of 100 or 150 or a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of modeling that did that so um that's not something next to Hagri will be funding so um yeah so we yeah we definitely there definitely is that need i guess people anecdotally we know that people make more money by making good selection decisions but and there's been good models around that, but yeah, we haven't got it in here about like, yeah what what sort of money you would expect to make from making those changes. But it's a good is point. That, something is that where your sort of individual farm indexes would sort of come in handy? Yeah, they're still desired gains indexes uh, for a range of reasons. Well, we do we did some economic well we did economic modeling to get the base index and then. Like the individual deviations from that aren't really dollar indexes in their true in their true form uh, because really you need a model of every individual farm to do that we have yeah it's something that it's a good area to of interest uh, and and so if someone's got a someone at home that's amazing on computers it would be good for them to get in and do some modeling but yeah no we haven't the yeah the most of the our indexes are all still desired gains because of the complexities of like traits like we're talking about tonight like worms dags foot rot structure they're very difficult to or much more difficult to put an economic value on is it the chemicals you use or extra labor and, and accounting for them properly like something like lamb growth is relatively easy to value um 
but still done poorly because we don't account for how much extra feed those fast growing lambs or it's easy not to account for it the proper models do account for it or things like going for extra lambs or more twins or whatever though you have to make sure you value that those sheep extra eat more feed to do that so um <clears throat> so yeah so all of our processes are still designed again so it's a, definitely a hole in and something that we probably should close that hole because people ask it a fair bit around the um so what's the value of a ram i suppose uh, if i'm paying fifteen hundred dollars for a for an average ram or two grand for a for a good one am i in front or am i behind or and that sort of question is 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 definitely re relevant how does your individual farm um indexing sort of work is it uh like you take a spreadsheet of a ram catalog and then index it or do you just have a spreadsheet that you plug in an individual ram at a time and it weights it uh no so it well the tool works by basically we download the population that you're selecting from and then we have a, a process of, of of using uh weightings for each trait and, and when you can change those weightings and then it looks then it looks at what you were select on based on those weightings and says okay if my selected population is now 0.1 kilos heavier or whatever or cuts five percent more fleece weight and then we tweak those weightings until where the client is happy with the kind of selected population from the current population so it's sort of a little bit it's unique to to the flock a bit because or particularly if you're a well well measured flock um because it sometimes like you'll be strong and some breeders are really good in a trait like they might be really good at weaning rate but they're not so good at i don't know maternal weaning weight or something and uh and so you're waiting for weaning rate and your flock doesn't have to be as high to get a good number as it would be if you're in a flock that's that's quite weak for that trait so so it and then once you've got you're happy with the weightings then you can just use those weightings like then you just multiply out the index and so it's it's just a simple excel formula to calculate the index from the breeding base um and so then you can do the whole drop and that's so we've developed a tool that does all that automatically um and so you end up with a index on each individual in the flock from lambs through to use through to everyone uh and and then use that well, we use that in our mate cells, our matings, and then in our selection decisions as well. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's definitely the biggest formulas I've ever written, and now I think Henry might have been bigger when he took over. So, um, anyway, the if we get on with our traits tonight, so yeah, resistance to worms really topical in on both sides of the ditch, but New Zealand's probably. This came to the fore recently as we've seen flocks sort of entering the scary realm of triple drench resistance. So only left with Startex and, uh, and Zolvex is the only real uh, drugs that kill worms. Uh, talking to someone the other day that had sort of triple drenches down to 45% effective and that sort of stuff, which means that uh, you're sort of pouring expensive chemicals down the throat that aren't actually killing the worms. So uh, a range of things to do there genetics not the only answer but it's one of those answers that that as we select for animals that are more resistant to worms we require less drenches therefore there's less selection pressure on the worm population to get um to get to be resistant to those chemicals and then and then yeah so it sort of slows down that whole development of of resistance to drenches uh and you can go right through to the other end of that spectrum where you've got lots of farmers who drench their young sheep a few times but then don't drench old sheep at all and because those old sheep aren't ever getting drenched they can be they're great uh, carriers of susceptible worms if you like so if we think about how drench resistance would form it's it's, it's essentially genetics in action it's just a selection process that you don't want to happen but it happens so you're selecting for you're really speeding up evolution of those worms for particular chemicals so that because they're running through a really rapid life cycle while it takes us 
seemingly forever to improve our sheep or our cattle or whatever towards the, our, our aim. Worms, because they're rattling through lots and lots of generations, uh, you end up selecting those uh, that uh, the ones that survive to breed on are the ones that are resistant to drenches. And that's not a problem, obviously, early days because there's lots of susceptible worms out in the pasture. What we found in particularly in Australia where things like double summer drenching were really effective at reducing worm populations because all the sh worms are in the sheep. There's nothing alive on the pasture. The Some eggs are overwintering or oversummering in the, in the ground, but most of the worms are... Are either getting cooked uh, by the sun or uh, in the sheep, and therefore, if you hit them with a drench, then you kill most of that population. Obviously, the problem with that is that all of the, the only ones that sort of continue were there to continue the next generation were the ones that didn't get killed by that drench, and so half drenched sheep or yeah, sheep that um, had a or worms in there that didn't get killed by that drench became the next population. So that's how drench resistance formed quickly in in Western Australia particularly, and then I guess in New Zealand there's not so much of, like often it's green when there's when we're drenching, so there's still a lot of our larvae on pasture, but just the the sheer amount of drenching, the, sh the use of a lot of capsules um, has has meant that worms are exposed to, a, to the drench for long periods of time and therefore the ones that have, the population that's, we've ended up, having is one that is now resistant to the our key chemicals and that's been that's a been a factor forever uh, and that's why triples drenches existed because worms tend to be resistant to one active and not to all actives and so you can kind of by putting mixing the drenches up you were attacking the worm in different ways and and killing it in different ways but but that's now now failed so so yeah part of our future has to be and is resistance to worms so using the breeding values and these are available in sill and sheep genetics to to find a to find sheep that require less drenching and, and it's a handy sort of a breeding value in that it's pretty easy to work out what it means so if we look over on the on the table there what's good for WEC in in may 2023 so what does the minus 19 mean that means so that's the average of the population now so we've shifted the average population to be 19 percent better so it's basically a percent lowering of work so if you had we'll do easier math so if we've got a minus 50 if your lamb drop or your u drop was going to be 500 eggs per gram and therefore or say we'll go 400 eggs per gram and therefore required a drench um i might if that whole flock was minus 50 that'd be 50 percent lower so that'd be um, 200 eggs per gram and you might be able to get away without drenching them or you delay that delay that drench so and what we see, um, a couple of graphs here, which just show um, the role that that can play in terms of egg counts getting up over the, the lambing period. So obviously our key stress or key time where worms get away on us are, uh, is that, that lambing period because you get the periparturient drop in immunity. So just around lambing, the immune system basically shuts off. Um, that, and that's what's been yeah, okay. keeping the worm... What was that sorry? I think that was someone's yeah. mic. Yeah. All good. Yeah. Can I? Uh, I'll just pop in. Could you zoom in onto a single page, just for anyone that's on a cell phone? They might not be able to see those graphs. There's a zoom in the top right. Uh, just to zoom in on those graphs. I don't want to talk about them. Yeah. Cool. How do we get that guy over there? Is that better? Um, so this graph here is some work done out of WA. Um, but so our black line is is a resistant mob we use. So they've been selected for worm resistance for a number of generations and the yellow line being a control use that haven't been selected. And that peripaturient rise in worm egg count basically knocked out by those selection for worm, uh, selection for resistance. So it's kind of like you, you have drenched them, but you haven't. Um, and so that means there's less less contamination on the pasture for those growing lambs. So these are the same group, and they, someone was crazy enough to measure worm larvae uh, on pasture, and these are um, the number of larvae per kilogram of dry matter of pasture. They might have missed a few. It's pretty um, would be pretty hard on the drafting gate, but the um, and so these are those control use. These yellow line 
this is how many larvae are on the pasture after lambing versus these that can, um, resistant line and the same oh, pre-lamb it's yeah because it wasn't really up pre-lamb there's a few more larvae there pre-lamb but post-lamb when you've got those lambs are starting to eat the pasture and starting to graze pasture within that resistant group of sheep there's a lot less larvae out there to be um, infecting infecting those young sheep so all young lambs are born without any immunity to worms so um, so they're getting a benefit of mum not basically spreading larvae all over the pasture or, or at a reduced rate. So it's a pretty cool trait. Um, what we see is that people that start focusing on it move it really quickly. Um, so once you're only using negative rams, so rams that are less than zero, means that sort of of the starting population, the rams you've got are, are in the better half, and the more negative you get them, you seem to quickly get into a position where those sheep aren't as affected by worms. One thing to be careful of is it might buy one worm resistant ram and chuck him in with you use and he's in the ram paddock or whatever. If he's like a minus 80 and all the other rams in the paddock are, are plus 20s, for example, he's going to be fighting all the worms for everyone else because those plus 20s don't react in the same way, don't fire up their immune system in the same way. And this happens in, in flocks of you. So as we move towards... Um, worm resistant sheep or if you one run worm resistant sheep with with non resistant sheep you can it can look like you're suppressing production because they're actually firing up an immune system they're they're genetically programmed to fight worms and they're not normally they'd be in a paddock like this where there's no worms around because their mates have them and their mates have controlled the worms for themselves but you put them in a paddock where you got someone who's not doing the work they're not hasn't got the immune system running and they're having to kill worms for for everyone and so that can look like those resistant animals are actually doing more poorly. But normally that's just a result of the fact that they're actually, um, it's a part of the process of moving to genetic resistance to worms is that, that you're going to have those more resistant ones might, might suffer a bit. But we generally, people move flocks over time and we sort of, that's relatively well controlled. But, um, but I think it's one of the, the most powerful tools in our toolkit we've got a lot of people getting into it now after the scare we've had in in recent times uh and so i think yeah it's a really important trait that in particularly in formal sheep that are more susceptible to worms but also in in our and the rest in all sheep um probably terminals are one that you might sort of juries out a bit whether you would bother um because um if those lambs are finishing quickly and gone then then your worm resistance doesn't matter too much but if if you're buying store lambs um you probably want them from a ram that that was resistant to to uh to worms so that your yeah, each individual business can make a call on on that and there are definitely are some terminals chasing chasing this trade as well um so yeah unfortunately the only way to measure it is is getting your fingers warm or a teaspoon or something getting getting individual fecal samples from from individual sheep you have to get the the uh the mob average up pretty high um well not super high but sort of 300 eggs per gram but we sort of recommend more like 500 or 600 eggs per gram in scale worm country and and over 1500 eggs per gram in barber's pole but you basically got to make sure that there's enough worms there that this you can separate the susceptible from resistant sheep so so one of the challenges is as people get better at this trait or the sheep get better at this trait it's harder and harder to get that mob to to get high enough to get the sample. So you'll see some people um, struggling on that front and having to really hammer their or put their rams under a bit of nutritional pressure and a lot of parasite pressure to 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 get the egg count high enough. But that's one of the challenges. That's the the joys of ram breeding, I suppose. But um, yeah, really, well, for me, it's a really interesting trade, and we've finally got some movement in New Zealand in the final game where people are actually actually measure it's not cheap it's sort of seven bucks a sample per ram um which is why we want to make sure you get enough challenge there before you do the sampling because if you sample them send them away get them tested and the average comes back lower and your data gets kicked out you've just burnt five to ten grand and achieved nothing which is something we obviously try and avoid but um the one of the beauties of the trait is that it's not correlated with anything much it's um there's some some correlations most of them are favorable high muscle and high fat uh are favorably correlated with worm egg count staple strength and low cv high growth um 
some evidence of slightly lower fleece weight, but definitely manageable. Uh, one thing to, and we'll go into DAG next, but people think that selecting from worm resistance will get rid of DAG, like and that's not, of DAG. That's, not, that's not the case. In fact, in some populations, it's the opposite, where if you select for worm resistant rams or sheep, you'll get a few more DAGs, but that's that correlation is now sort of seems to have disappeared uh, or is or is low. So, but one thing is for sure, you have to select for both DAG and worm egg count if you want to fix both DAG and egg count. Is there a question there or? I'm just looking at my screen and babbling on, but. And I was just wondering, has anyone um, come up with a drench with either worm eggs in it to try and get the numbers up? Because we can't. <laughs> you have to. You have to move to Linton's farm, mate, where it's getting all the rain. Um, the There was a mob out of New England, but it was cost prohibitive last time I checked. Um, they were doing it. They were breeding susceptible, uh, yeah, susceptible worms, mainly for the idea being you would drench your sheep that are starting to have drench resistance problems, and that would bring all those susceptible worms in, would breed out the the resistant worms and get you back on square one so that company i just can't remember the name of it but um yeah but i think it was i don't know it was over it was 30 or 40 bucks a, a sheep or something so it was um yeah so if you did that plus the testing it sort of becomes pretty pretty expensive um but i guess yeah if you're as long as you're not selling rams into yeah and so for and i should have covered that um, some environments, this is a, an irrelevant trait because you're not, you don't have a lot of worm pressure, so it would be a trait you wouldn't select on. Um, but obviously, then you, you can't control where ram buyers come from. So some people rock up and want to want to um, buy your rams anyway, and and we're asking for the trait. But it is yeah, certainly a challenge for um, the yeah, lower rainfall environments. The because mainly because the I mean, it's easiest when you've got young sheep and when you've got generally when those young sheep or sort of weaned lambs and stuff generally going into a period of, of heat and there's not enough worms around and then by the time they get into when there are worms around, then they've sort of developed their own immunity and they can fight them off pretty well and it's pretty hard to get the numbers up. So, um, yeah, that's certainly a challenge for this trade. It is uh, now predicted with genomics, so, so our as long as you're well linked and using rams from flocks that are doing a bit of work then you can get predictions from genomics obviously not as good as doing it itself but but genomics is now predictive for WEC, so that that's probably the only real option in those drier environments dag in the interest of time which is my second favorite trait i've got lots of favorite traits but um everyone loves a bit of dag so let, yeah moving on from from worms i suppose but dag is is a trait that I don't know, we probably forgot about, not forgot about, but we certainly didn't forget about DAGs, but forgot how much genetics can control it. Um, yeah, so, well, I probably wasn't aware of the power of of those really resistant or low DAG animals to, and how much it would shift. So, I mean, the rate that no one needs to be told why DAG's important, obviously correlated with breach strike, um, correlated with yeah, loss of wool value as well having to all well, this labor getting them off there's loss of wool value by the wool that gets contaminated and uh and and then there's the risk of fly strike and then there's having to dag before they go to the works so there's every reason why we don't want feces on the back of sheep um i guess what what we now what we've known for a year for a while but what we've sort of seen a lot lately is that it is really, really repeatable. Um, it's quite heritable, so 30% heritability. And anyone that's scored DAGs on their sheep will know that um, that those that score good at, or bad at weaning will be the ones that are bad next time you're, you've got DAGs on those mobs. So so for the breeder, it's a, or from the breeders, it's a simple one to five score, one being no DAG and five being heap of DAG. Um, and that's done whenever the mob gets daggy and um and that gets sent away gets like all those trades converted into a breeding value but what we're seeing is that when you get into these numbers these are really handy and we've got some rams now that are sort of out to minus one and above minus one for dag and they just do not 
ever get a dag on them and their their progeny just don't get a dag on them it's it is so stark when you use those really good dag ramps so it's something that um again this is in environments with only in southern parts of australia and most of new zealand gets plenty of dags um but there's sort of northern half of australia or not even northern half but once you get up into india sort of temperate areas then dag disappears um but in the south sort of southern wa through south south and south of south australia and victoria there's and and across the south on and north on there's plenty of dags um and yeah it's a trait that that is really powerful at, at taking work out of our mobs we haven't there's a few people have been doing it for a number of years just culling culling daggy ones but i guess like everything you can go a lot faster if you use the breeding values and you don't um you can do it in a balanced way when you use the breeding values so if you're out there buying rams then anything negative is kind of good the average is just below zero so that if if you're buying a ram that's negative for dag then it's going to be better than better than the average of the population for dag and and the more negative the less likely it is you're going to have to be crutching those those lambs and so i think i think we'll see a future and i'm not just not just pumping this i reckon there'll be a future where we'll have flocks that you sort of dag the odd one so dagging becomes the exception rather than the rule um and i know there's environments where that probably seems impossible but there's farms that we work with here that are literally the home of dags and and still those if you get size out at minus one their progeny just don't have dags um so yeah it's a really cool thing it's obviously some i don't we don't understand the biology completely but it is independent of of worm challenge so the ones that get daggy from moving onto a turnip crop or that will be the same ones that get daggy from a worm challenge or whatever like whatever for whatever reason generally that it's repeatable across different reasons that they're getting dags um so it's something around gut health or it's basically consistency of the feces whether it's hard pebbles or or soup and uh and it seems to be sort of re repeatable and heritable so yeah again i think it's a trait that we probably as an industry haven't thought too much about maybe but i think it's um yeah the ones that are focusing on it now are really starting to see a lot of a lot of value because there's i don't need to tell any of you about the difficulties in getting labor and difficulties getting people to do work and the cost of of taking taking dags off there aren't question on it dags but linton did have a good question about comment on resistance versus resilience on worms i don't know if you want to oh, come yeah. back to that. so yeah good one and depends on uh this is a sort of ongoing argument it not like yeah people have different opinions about resilience versus resistance uh so resilience is a sheep that won't necessarily fight the worms but won't be impacted on the worms there's good evidence that if you turn off the immune system and throw worms in a sheep then it cruises along pretty happily because it's really the it's the intake suppression so they stop when they get crook from worms um they stop eating and therefore or reduce what they how much they eat um so you get a stomach ache and and that's mainly the immune system reacting to the worms rather than the worms themselves and so so there are sheep out there that don't react to the worms therefore don't get a belly ache and keep eating and keep growing and are happy as happy as larry the problem with those sheep is that they'll be the ones that are throwing out thousands of larvae onto the pasture so while they're not impacted on it uh, by it the rest of the flock that's cruising around with it will be and particularly those young lambs that are naive to to worms and and haven't developed their immune system yet they'll be copying a lot of larvae and and therefore having that that challenge so um, resilience and resistance would be good because if you do drop the ball they won't pack up when they get worms but if they're resistant as well at least they will then their immune system will fire up and and reduce that because you want a sheep that or a mob of sheep that can get to 350 400 eggs per gram and and just by providing a bit of nutrition and uh, and a bit of management they'll start to control their population down and and a resistant sheep or all sheep will do that a resistant sheep will do that faster a resilient sheep has no real reason to get rid of those worms because it's not impacting them so so yeah it's a um i guess my pick has always been resistance i'm happy to entertain people that do both resilience and resistance but i'm not that keen on someone who's just doing resilience um because i think 
and this is the true for everything we talk about. We're talking about mobs of sheep. We don't have one far, sheep on a farm making us money. We have between whatever five hundred and twenty thousand sheep on a farm, and and it's that whole mob that makes your money. And if one just because one's resilient, and then if it's impacting the lambs or impacting someone else, then then that trait's not of not of much value to me. So, yeah, really good question. And we don't have any. There are there's a resilience breeding value, and still in in sheep genetics, we don't have a resilience breeding value. You could argue that by selecting for growth under a wormy environment, you kind of get some resilience. Um, but yeah, it's probably more precise to be yeah, finding those sheep that are more resistant to worms. And I think for our sort of drench argument or our, our problem of um, of failing drenches, then we're still going to big egg counts on those resilient animals. So we're still going to be most managers are still going to be drenching those sheep. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's a, I would go for resistance if, uh, if given the choice or whenever given the choice. If we rattle on to my next favorite trait, which is, which is foot rot. Uh, and so this is the reason I'm in New Zealand is, is foot rot, um, that, that and the fishing, but, um, but it is, yeah, the reason that New Zealand Reno employed me in the first place and got me over to, into New Zealand was was to start this work on breeding, on a breeding bay for furrot and very, very, as you would have heard me crap on I met before, very excited to have the breeding bay for furrot that we now uh, can can call our own and, and we can use in our breeding programs and the industry has, has it available to us. Um, it's, yeah, it was a, a big chunk of work funded partially by the breeders of sheep in New Zealand, partially by New Zealand Marina Company and partially by Ministry for Primary Industries and from Reno Inc, which was some money, uh, some Marino grow money as well. So yeah, big project anyway, uh, with Sam Walkham doing the science at Agbu and a heap of people here in New Zealand uh, that that we worked together to, to bring this about. So now we've got this breeding way for foot ride and so in our catalogues in New Zealand, you'll see lots of foot rot breeding bays this year, which is probably the first year it's been really openly available. Everyone's been hiding it because it wasn't that flash for a while. When you go into a new trait, you you end up with um, yeah, you end up with some sheep that are awesome for it and some that are terrible. And so it was a bit of a run of a bit of a bit of luck. So basically, what we do when we develop the or when we measure a sheep for foot rot, we put them under or we either act from a natural challenge of foot rot or we put them under some sort of challenge where foot rot is occurring. So most of this happens on farms where, where foot rot is present. Um, and we score each foot zero being perfect. One, having some water maceration where you get a little bit of wrinkling of the skin, it's been in the bath too long. Two, you can't see really clearly, but it's got some inflammation between, between the claws. Three, you're starting to get some underrunning. So you're actually getting um, lift on the heel. Four is when that lift goes right across the sole of the of the foot and then five is where it runs around to the toe and you've got what you might commonly call foot rot which is the whole foot sort of infected with diclobactin nidosis um anyway so that's happens still happens that's how we set up the breeding bay um and and what we've found over time is is essentially this is this is an old graph now but it still tells the story pretty well the the, the normal distribution you can see there the histogram is the population of sheep. So we've got very few down here at minus one and, a, and very few at plus one. But so most of the population sitting between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5 for foot rot. Um, and then if we have a look at what that means, this is the percentage of progeny in each score. So if we go to a plus 0.5 and we look here at this interception intersection here, we've got roughly 30% of the sheep of the uh, progeny of that animal will have uh, we'll have underrunning foot rot, so four plus, so worse than, so bad foot rot. Two thirds of the population will at least have underrunning foot rot of some description, and kind of over eighty percent of the population will have um, will be at least score two. So the most of those sheep, most of those progeny are lame, and some of these severely lame. Um, and then if we go minus point five, we've got about half the population have got a bit of a touch of something. A third of the population have got some underrunning, but 
but only on a very small part of that population have got some has actually progressed to full foot rot. And that's what we're seeing that you might get a little bit under running, but then it self cures and goes away. And so that was the population we started with. We've now, and it's still there, but we're now getting rid of most, a lot of these sheep are getting selected out of the population. So I think the best ram that goes up for auction this year will be a minus 1.2. So it's out here somewhere. And they are like bank on it, sort of, yeah, bet your house on it that they won't get foot rot and their progeny will be miles away. And we've already got flocks now that kind of are doing a lot less foot bathing, have just almost, yeah, foot rot becoming a non event because the sheep are fighting it. So again, it's not correlated with very much. The only correlation is that it's it's favorably correlated with um with worm resistance uh, in a small way. So you can't rely on that. But generally obviously both traits must be must have the immune system involved. Um and so those sheep that tend to be a bit better for worms tend to be a bit better for foot rot. But but that's about it. So it means you can select for it and not many other things change, which is a great situation to be in in genetics. If you had a trait like early days when fleece weight and fibre number, for example, where you where every time you reduce micron you lost fleece weight. So it sort of meant that economic equation was hard to work through. Um obviously we've broken that now, but um yeah, but it's but it not being correlated with much means that we can put a big chunk of our selection pressure on it and not really impact our breeding program too much other than a little bit of loss of, of sort of selection pressure. So, yeah, really awesome to see this year. We've got lots of sheep um, in these ranges. And once it, I never like putting numbers on things, it doesn't stop me, but we shouldn't do it too much. But we seem to be around this. We've now got plenty of sheep around this minus 0.6, and that seems to be where you get a noticeable difference in what's happening in the flock. Some of these sheep, like minus 0.2s and stuff, they're obviously a little bit better, but um but uh yeah not necessarily a noticeable change but we're starting to see flocks that have been using a lot of these sort of rams and really starting to get a lot less lame sheep and a lot less foot rot happening so it's the beauty about it is it's it's permanent um you don't yeah, the more genetic gain, genetic gain you make the less foot rot you've got and and the other beautiful thing is that and it's a similar to the worms equation um a small change in foot rot, so making them a bit better than the average, means there's less really badly affected sheep and therefore less bacteria being shed on the pasture and therefore less challenge for young sheep. Um, and so what uh, a PhD student showed years ago in Scotland was that a little bit of selection pressure can actually have a big impact on, on management, which is not the norm, I suppose. If you select for growth, you select for a kilo, you get a kilo, and that's what you get. There's sort of no other impacts of that. Um, whereas in disease traits, because you're also selecting, or your selection is also changing how much challenge is out there, it actually has a, a greater than, the impact you have on your production system is greater than the genetic gain you made, which is, which is pretty cool. So I was, um, yeah, can't, can't over, get overly, well, very excited about the opportunity in here and we're really proud to now be running a project in australia to mirror the work there so animal health australia helped us do a couple of challenges of some weathers in the last few years and now animal health australia and awi have come together to help us run a progeny test in final sheep in australia and uh, a ram challenge site so we're we're going to get all the same information in australia as we've got in in new zealand which will really just supercharge the effort to to see the back of foot rot in, in fine wool sheep. Um, so that's underway at the moment. There's still a couple of spots available for rams. If there's any, uh, anyone listening that would like to get a ram into that, into that, uh, central progeny test, it's, um, yeah, a great opportunity to, to, to start to understand what's happening in the Australian scenario. There's lots of breeders that are keen and doing the right thing on that front. Uh, it's obviously different in Australia where foot rot is a, is a, communicatable disease so you get your farm shut down and stuff in New Zealand it's uh, just there and, and part of life a bit um, but equally we've, we've found ways to make sure we can do it uh, within the rules but um, yeah pretty exciting to to see the back of back of foot over time and and we're certainly yeah certainly the the industry here is really marching the people that have focused on it have really got sheep that are that are really, really good for foot rot, which is, which is getting pretty exciting. 
<clears throat> Any questions on that one? I have a, would you mind just talking about the other foot score that appears in RAM catalogs around New Zealand? Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> um, so when we started out, we had, oh, I should have a graph, but I haven't. Um, so the Lincoln foot, uh, what's it called? Lincoln, Lincoln. Anyway, there's a foot right test that Lincoln have been rolling out with uh, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 2, 2. So they're... Um, their scores of haplotypes of genes within the MHC region, which is a long way of saying there's a bit of DNA there that's in the immune region that in a population of coralal sheep was found to be correlated with, with foot rot, and they scored the haplotypes as to whether they were the, so the fives were the most, uh, so haplotypes are sort of groups of genes. Um, and five, they scored the ones that were the most, the sheep that carried that set of genes were the most susceptible and ones were the ones where they were were more resistant to foot rot. Um, we've tested it on a number of occasions, lots of so lots of sheep that had that score we've progeny tested, and we can't find any correlation between that scoring system and and foot rot. Uh, and we get yeah, lots of lots of hate mail from the from the developer of that test, but the reality is we can't find any correlation, and then that's not because we're trying to say this science is better than that science all we want to do is have a system that works for for sheep breeders and we know this foot rot uh, the spreading value does and it makes sense so when we first started out um it was as far as we understood it controlled about three percent of the genetic variation for foot rot was that test we can't we we've never identified that three percent we've never seen that come up in our data but that could be just error um whereas obviously breeding values work on a hundred percent of the of the genetic variation they 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 don't distinguish between which gene they're um, changing. They just find the set of genes that are more resistant. So, so that was a that was good science that was done thirty plus years ago, maybe twenty plus years ago, and was the best people had. But now this system is is so far in front that it's it's not funny. So, yeah, it's not worth the it's not worth the thirty bucks that, that it takes. When we set out on this journey, we wanted to have a um, a genomic breeding way for foot rot so the intention was that again we'd take a drop of blood and or a chunk of ear and we would predict the foot rot um we're not there yet but like as we sort of know that how genomics has evolved because we keep adding genotypes and phenotypes so there's more sheep that have a genotype and some that have have been measured for foot rot the more that happens the more data we in the system and the closer we get to a, a single step analysis where genomics and and the phenotypic assessment of foot rot is is together. So I'm confident now with the Australian work starting up that sometime in the next few years it'll be a, like um, like worm egg count foot rot will be there and predictable from from DNA. It's it's just a matter of a matter of time, I think. And and I might be wrong. That might well, I think we'll get there eventually, but that might be more than three or four years away. But um, like all genomics, that will still need phenotypes. So we still need to feed in the actual measures to keep the genomics bit working. But, but yeah, we are hoping to get to a DNA test because obviously that means we don't have to put sheep under under foot rot challenge um, to get get the data. But um, and I guess we do get challenged about the ethics of of that. But I guess in my mind, if if a few hundred sheep need to get a, or get a disease that that rather than hundreds of thousands of sheep getting that same disease i think um, and certainly we've got ethics approval for all the all the work we do and and ethics committees are out um, without fail are happy to endorse that that concept where that some animals no doubt do suffer but um but we have pain relief and stuff in 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 part of the protocols in australia um but the aim is obviously to to reduce the suffering of hundreds of thousands if not millions of sheep um and and it's working so yeah um yeah but the lincoln test is is no longer and, and uh, i mean i guess people have voted with their feet really the a lot of the breeders that were using that test have now swapped over and using the breeding value and 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 aren't using that test anymore so that's sort of i think that's pretty much the people that have the breeding value available to them don't use a lincoln test and that's pretty much uh, enough evidence to, to tell you what's working and what's not. Can I just ask if you are going somewhere buying a ram, they don't have the breeding value, but they do have the Lincoln test. 
Are you better just taking a good look at the feet yourself rather than even looking at those numbers? Um, I wouldn't look at the numbers, but the feet don't help you much either. Uh, so yeah. the just ignore them. <laughs> well, I guess what we are finding is that foot shape where there's been some challenge, so whether that's a benign foot rod, a bit of scold, whatever, if there's been wet environments and those feet are still in good shape, I reckon they will be the more resistant ones. Um, yeah. If it's a dry environment, if you're out where Dob is and there's been no challenge at all, um, then a good shaped foot won't be necessarily more resistant to foot rot, if that makes sense. So because what, oh, and this is my my understanding or my interpretation of the biology is what happens when you get an infection, whether it's foot rot or just what we call scold or OID, um, you get increased blood flow to the foot, therefore the keratin grows more, same as you increase blood flow to the wool follicle, you get more wool growth, increase blood flow to the foot, you get more toe growth. And so if there's no infection there, the, the reason for that toe growth is more about the genetics of toe growth than it is about reaction to the infection. Whereas I think if you get a, a good shaped foot where there has been some challenge, I think that would be a an indicator, not a guarantee, but definitely an indicator. We do find there's a couple of sires that they throw really good feet under challenge and they are coming out to be resistant. Um, but equally, we had sheep come through big challenges, not get any foot rot, but had terrible, terrible feet and you'd kill them for foot structure anyway. So there's not none of those. The foot rot bring value is by far and away the best, but in the absence of that, looking at foot shape where there's been sheep running in wet environments, a bit of a bit of infection of some description, then, then that would be a, a bit of an indicator. And that brings us to structure. So what we're looking to do in that in that work with Animal Health Australia and AWI and what we've been doing with our breeders for the last couple of years is and particularly Linton Arnie who's on who's online. So we've been working with him to try and develop artificial intelligence to do this stuff. Um and so he's taken lots of photos of lots of sheep's feet uh for all his RAM catalogues. Um a bit of a COVID baby as well. But but what we're looking to do is understand the genetics of foot structure in addition to foot rot, so independent of, of foot rot, because um, both of these are a big source of wastage in our industry. We, we cull a lot of sheep for crook feet or crook pastons or crook structure generally. Um, and anecdotal, well, not anecdotally, just by moving around the amount of places we get to have a look around, I guess, is that some of it is obviously genetic and, and maybe all of it is genetic, but but under some conditions, the animals are more predisposed to it. Um, it seems to be that, which would make sense, that animals that grow really fast because they've been fed a lot and before they've sort of matured much, they seem to have pastern problems. Um, depending on the feeding, you can grow longer toes in, in some sheep. And, and so there's a whole heap of things that that mean that we're culling rams that, that in a different season or on a different farm, we might not cull. And we see that in our flocks. You, we might go to a, a stud and cull 30% of the rams for feet and legs and then we look through the ewes and we can't find anything wrong with them because they're not as heavy. They've been running in different environments or whatever. So what we want to do is work out, like separate the genetics from the environment, which is what our job is really across as breeders, as breeders is making sure we're selecting on genetics, not not environment. Um, and so we've developed a scoring system for, for feet. So we look at, um, which I can get, get it up if i can find it um we look at oh that won't come up with it um anyway so we're looking at foot shape so that side angle uh shape which i'll scroll in on um so we do this this and these are sophie's drawings well done sophie um the so the side angle which is pretty classic to see what a good foot is and what's what's not so we score that we also score foot roll so those sheep um that sort of collapse sideways and we score front foot twist so whether that those feet are twisted and we can argue about what's good and what's bad but we score all those things with the intention that um we might be able to drop one or two of those scores but we're trying to score everything so that we can work and then get towards breeding values of those and what they're correlated with and then and then drop some if we can or combine some if we can so that um but we're trying to do everything 
with as much detail as possible so that we can work out what's going on genetically and then help breeders select for that. So within our breeding, within our progeny tests that we're running um, in Australia, we're going to score these traits. We've scored them all in New Zealand. We've scored them probably maybe 30, 40,000 of these traits now of these animals across our client base. Um, and, and so we're working with sheep genetics to, uh, with Agbu to hopefully start analyzing that data in, in time or we're analyzing it, but trying to get a breeding value for that data. Past an angle again, talked about that. Um, and we score each or both front end back pastons for that. Same with feet. We score them separately. So we're not doing an average. It's front feet, back feet or front shape, back shape, front roll, back roll, front paston, back pastons, um, and front twist. Um, and then we're also scoring hawks, which we can argue whether it's got any economic value or not, but most people don't like hockey animals and certainly you can get animals that get urine stain or, or dags on the inside of the hawks, which predisposes to fly strike. So, um, again, if we've got a breeding value, people can then decide about how much emphasis they put on it. But at the moment we do a lot of independent culling on these traits that some of it will be genetic for sure. Things like hawks, you can't imagine environment having much of an impact on, but things like foot shape and, um, foot roll could be, could have, could have some. So, um, yeah, so that's all part of our, part of the project, part of our desire to get breeding values on, on everything. We sort of work on the theory that most of the things we look at on a sheep, we can score. And, and the, if we score it, we can, we can account for the environmental differences within those scores. And then we can calculate a breeding value. And then we're in a position to be better acting than we would be if we just cull an animal cause it's got crook feet doesn't mean you might, I mean, we still cull those animals at the moment because they've got crook feet, but we also score it. And, and I guess what we've found is that it's highlighting some sire effects and stuff to us that we might've picked up if we're just going through culling rams, you're going, oh, I'll cull that one because it's got crook feet. But when you actually score it, it forces you to look at it. It allows you to calculate a sire average. And then you go, well, that ram's actually lost 30% of his progeny for, for back feet, um, even though he looks all right himself. So we're already using it um, usefully, but if it's a breeding value, it'd be even better. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I've got the trait guide up and I can share it if you want. Um, so that's our yeah, shape trait. Um, and then if we go down to roll, do we? Yeah, so you see some of those shape that um, are very square and others that are collapsing sideways. We don't really... Um, yeah, again, I guess we're interested as to where what's going on there is that straight, like if it's not heritable, then it's something environmental. Um, it probably is going to be heritable because we see side effects of it, but we want to know that and we want to know how heritable and, and, that, and what it's correlated with. So it's a bit of a passion project, I suppose, um, but now being supported by by the industry, which is great because it's, um, yeah, we lose a lot of sheep that, and particularly in well, everywhere you've got to, um, You've got to show we've got to walk around the place. Um, so what we're looking at here is our trait appraisal guide. So we've developed this a while back. Um, so it's got a fair bit of crossover with um, some of the all the trait guides that AWI MLA have. Um, but it's uh, yeah, we did it mainly like to get those foot structure traits and have all the have it all in one place for our for our clients and anyone interested. You can download it off off the website if you're interested. We haven't made a printed version of that um but we do print individual pages as we as we're cruising around to get ourselves on the right page how do you navigate traits where um i guess best isn't good if that makes sense so um oh, hang on. like stay yeah, so, um, yeah so yeah so i guess um and even things like pastons, I reckon like our one is very upright. And I don't think that's probably not a natural paston. Like a two is probably where you want it. Um, but we thought it was important to, like so it's easier in our head to have it all. So some of the traits in the way that SG report it or look at it is, is it like three is optimum. But for me, it's, e well, it's easy to have a breeding value that would go from, 
from very down in the past to very upright. And then you say where we actually want them is minus 0.2 or where it happens to be. Um, and the same with like, uh, yeah, staple length is a good one in, in formal where some people, if you're sharing twice a year, you might want to go like more is better. Whereas if you're sharing once a year, then you've got to naturally cap that. Otherwise you'll end up pushing your length too long and, and end up discounting your value. So it's about understanding kind of on your farm under your management, what, what that breeding value plays out like. And that's obviously very difficult until you've got a few sheep and see what's happening. But, um, but I think, yeah, most, well, not even things like growth. Like I think for a long time we thought, well, the more the better because merinos don't grow. So the more we put in there, the better they will be. But, and I guess that's true if you can cap adult weight, but, um, but you don't obviously want cows if running in your sheep paddock. Um, and so you've got to minimize your, you've got to optimize growth maybe in some production system. And there's areas like where you just simply can't handle a heap of growth because they'll never actually reach that potential. And you're better off with a moderate you that's just chipping away and, and doing a thing and then maybe using that terminal system or using your first cross system or whatever to bring the growth in through crossbreeding rather than rather than through your whole maternal flock so yeah i think a lot of traits actually have an optimum there's not many that other than your health traits where better is better but like fleece weight um the more you jam on there is not like it seems to be well it's all money in the bank but it's not because you impact on on the survival of those animals fleece weight to body weight ratio impacts their reproduction so you can stack a lot of wool on but you'll lose some production through those ewes and they'll become harder to manage so there's yeah i think every almost every trait's got an optimum um and so we have to be careful about um yeah making sure we we have an understanding of those traits and it's i kind of feel like it's a bit um, we can have simple messages for a while. Then when people get really good at a trait, we have to get complex measures, um, messages because, because we have to help people navigate those, those new genotypes that kind of didn't exist. Like if we had said 20 years ago in a Merino that we want to slow down their growth. People think you're crazy, but, but kind of now you're saying, well, we've got Merinos that are getting very, very big and, and really high growth. So we might, we actually want, well, we can go for the high growth as long as they don't continue to grow throughout their life. So, um, yeah, so most traits have an optimum. I don't think I don't think anyone would want just enough dag to keep their handpiece handy. So there's a few traits where they'll where they'll have there is no optimum. Like they're, they're always going to be better. Um, but yeah, most traits I think we need to we need to um, we need to find the optimum. I think that's why you go in a ram catalog and lots of people are selecting for different sheep. Like you're not competing. What well, you compete with some people, but often you're competing on different sheep because you kind of got a different job in your head for what that ram's going to do. Um, I'm not sure everyone understands that they're trying to build an optimum sheep, but, um, but probably naturally that's what people understand they're trying to do. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, we have to be careful about using percentile bands to think their aims like percentile bands are just a really good description of, of the population. So you kind of can walk, can quickly look at a catalog going, Oh, yeah, it's about average of the population. I want to be a bit better than average. So I'll go here, but, um, it doesn't mean that you want every sheep to be in the top 1% of every trait because that'd be a pretty tough animal to feed, I imagine. Um, but yeah, good question. I just want to make a comment if I can. Um, it's apparent that, as you mentioned right at the beginning, there's the correlations that exist. And so with some of these health traits that we've got, um it's actually possible to buy animals with a breeding value where the trade has never been measured on those animals because of the correlations between what they've done yeah. and so I'd just like to make the comment it's really important to actually do your homework and just check and make sure the animals have been measured for that trade yeah really good point linton i think um and that goes for it doesn't matter whether it's a health trait, whether it's a growth trait, whether it's a reproduction trait, there's lots of yeah, animals will have breeding values and they won't have been measured for all those traits or some of them will have been, but most of them, some of them will be correlated traits. And yeah, if you're serious, if that's not in your breeding objective, like if it's not a trait that you're worried about or looking at even, um, then kind of that's not important to you. But if it's a trait that 
that you want to improve on and you're looking at it, then you want to be going to a breeder that's actually measuring it. Um, because yeah, if it's, while it's nice to get an estimate of what that animal is, those correlations are only, yeah, they're sort of the line in the blur and we're not, and you don't know whether that individual's blurred right up like way off the line or is right on the line. Um, and most of them are going to be off the line. So yeah, the reality is, um, uh, find breeders that you're aligned with in terms of the, what they're measuring so that, so that you're, yeah, you're selecting animals that have the full gamut of traits for the traits that are important to you. I think that's a really important thing. And, and we see that a bit where you're sort of, yeah, people discount an animal because it's bad for a trait and then go and buy another animal that hasn't been measured for that trait, but it's got a favorable correlation for that trait or whatever. Like it's, yeah. So you have to be, um, yeah, act with caution on, on traits that are just, that are just straight correlations. And, and that's true for probably the biggest one that we suffer a bit at the moment is like, we're pretty hot on trying to maintain or optimize adult weight, I suppose, not get too big for, for use, but a lot of breeders aren't measuring adult weight. And so it's sort of a correlation between post weaning weight and a few carcass measures and stuff that, and so, um, and it'd be the same in mature cow weight. Like if people aren't measuring those, those animals for it, then, then the breeding weight is just a correlation. So it's not actually that informative. You can't find curve benders and uh, real curve benders unless people are measuring for those traits. Um, before people start dropping off, just, yeah, just reiterate that if you want a copy of the buying guide, just let us know, particularly if you're in, if you're in Australia and someone will be going past, but, um, or we're yeah, happy to post them out and same in New Zealand will be, they're in the boot of my car. So if you, um, stumble across me at any point, we'll have to try and put them out at sales and stuff as we cruise around. But, um, uh, yeah, you're more than, more than welcome to more jump on the web and download your PDF, but. We've paid for printing, so you might as well get one printed. Oh, someone's paid for printing. How good sponsors have. And if you are wanting the PDF, they're on the resources tab on the Next Gen Agri page. So our next one will be Ken Solly and Bill Malcolm and myself chatting all things. What are we going to talk about? But I was going to say, I don't think there's an actual focus. So. We all grew up within about 10 k's of each other. We're in yeah, slightly different generations, but, um, but yeah, Bill Malcolm's economist out of Melbourne uni, which have been on the podcast and Ken Tully is a consultant, uh, so does a lot of business health type stuff. Uh, so yeah, really good, really good pair of brains who get on pretty well. So yeah, we're th thinking we'd have a general discussion with questions coming in from the, so that's going to be. Talk 12th of Feb. So, um, that should be, should be a bit of fun. Um, and we'll do that. I don't know. We'll convince them to do that a few times a year, I think, um, and talk about whatever's relevant, but thanks all enjoy your evenings and, uh, hopefully see, well, see a few of you about the place, but see you soon, Mark, Charlie. All right. Thanks all. Mm -hmm.